You're now listening to the Live Different Podcast with Matt Wilson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Live Different Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Wilson, and today I am very excited to have none other than Brant Courtright. We were just chatting that, yes, he is a PhD, which means he is Dr. Brant Courtright, a clinical psychologist and professor of psychology at the California Institute of Integral Studies. He has a consulting clinical practice uh, over there in California in the San Francisco Bay Area. He has written several books, including one that I'm most excited about, The Neurogenesis Diet and Lifestyle, Upgrade Your Brain, Upgrade Your Life. Brant, thanks for coming on today. I'm happy to be here. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I uh, I wanted to actually start out by something. I was uh, I'm in New York today, and I was on the train, preparing, skipping through all the stuff that I had underlined and and uh, pages that I had dog-eared. I, I think I, my audience knows by now that I'm quite the geek when it comes to to neuroscience. Honestly, uh, because just seeing my my grandfather's struggle with Alzheimer's and uh, my, my uh, also, my father has a form of dementia, PSP, parasupranuclear palsy, and uh, well, certainly I don't want anything like that to happen to myself, but it's just uh, it's just such a fascinating topic once you get into it, and I wanted to, to read a, a breakthrough that you had in this, uh, in this book, The Neurogenesis Diet and Lifestyle, and you talk about how you can operate at a higher level than ever before believed possible. And at any age, you can be smarter, remember more, be more vibrant, alive, free of depression, and resistant to stress. And when you increase your rate of neurogenesis, the farther reaches of the brain's potential is unknown. And that is really what I want to talk to uh, to you about today and see if we can help our our listeners really up their game when it comes to their brain function, their cognitive function, and just their, their overall health and happiness. So, uh, Brant, let's do it. What do you say? Great. Let's go. All right. Uh, so, I, I actually first, before we dive into all of the things that you can do for your your diet and your body and your heart, your mind, your spirit, all the different sections that you laid out in the book. Uh, as I understand that you came to have this interest in, in psychology, but in uh, neuroscience through consciousness and through uh, yoga and spirituality as you've written other books on it. And so I'm curious your story and and how you got to be uh, the Brant Cartwright of today. <laughs> well, um, yeah, as you say, I really came to this through psychology and spirituality. Um, transpersonal psychology, which is putting those two things together, is what I've been teaching for a few decades now. And that's really all about having your consciousness operate at a higher level having a kind of psycho-spiritual practice to work with the inner barriers to functioning at a higher level. And I think over the years, I've realized that I've actually kind of downplayed the role of the brain in all that, the physical brain, and focused more on the self and psychology and spiritual practice. And as I was doing a book on a holistic treatment for depression, meaning body, heart, mind, spirit, approach to depression. And I was researching the, the physical part, the body part. I realized that this current theory of serotonin deficiency causing depression is no longer valid. In fact, it was never really valid. And that actually the research shows that people who have depression of various kinds don't have lower serotonin levels, they have average serotonin levels. Some studies even show they have higher than normal serotonin levels. A few show lower, but most show pretty average. So they've now been through a kind of paradigm shift where they've realized that 
it's actually the increase in neurogenesis that is responsible for getting people out of depression. That neurogenesis is the process of making new brain cells, right? We've known about neuroplasticity for some time, which is making new connections among existing neurons. But neurogenesis only became clear that it happened in the late 1990s. Right? The, the, the traditional view is that the brain stopped growing somewhere in our early 20s. And after that, it was just one slow die off. But then they realized, no, the brain keeps growing new brain cells throughout our entire lifetime. And at first, they didn't know the significance of that. But then they began to realize that the rate of neurogenesis, that is the rate at which your brain makes new neurons, new brain cells, is hugely important and that a low rate of neurogenesis is associated with depression, with anxiety, with stress, and with cognitive decline and memory problems. And that a high rate of neurogenesis is associated with just the opposite, with rapid learning, with cognitive enhancement, with robust emotional resilience and protection against anxiety stress and depression. So then I realized that, wow, the real story here is about neurogenesis. The real story is about what the brain is actually capable of. Because we live in an environment where there are many, many, many neurotoxins that are slowing down our rate of neurogenesis. And most people can increase their rate of neurogenesis by five times, probably even more than that, with quite dramatic effects on all areas of life. So <clears throat> it turns out that this book, The Neurogenesis Diet and Lifestyle, it's a holistic approach to peak brain performance, meaning again, body, heart, mind, spirit, because there are spiritual practices that also seem to have quite a profound effect on our rate of neurogenesis. But it's like we need to use all parts of our consciousness together, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual, that they all work together synergistically to produce optimal brain performance, much better than just one or two. So that got me into this whole thing of realizing that actually neuroscience has quite a lot to teach us and that it's actually just been very recent that it's been discovered that there are a lot of things out there that decrease brain function that most people don't know about. And there are also a lot of things out there that increase brain function that almost nobody knows about. So that's what this book is, is really about. Because most people are functioning probably at 70 or 80% of their brain's capacity. There are so many neurotoxins in the environment. It's like a minefield to just get through daily life. And nobody does this consciously. We all just kind of innocently stumbled into this. But now it's, it, it's like it's death by a thousand cuts. You know, you don't even notice one or two or even 20 or 30. But after 100 or 200, you begin to notice it. But since it's mysterious about what caused it, most people don't even recognize it's happening. And it's also gradual. So it's don't even recognize it's happening. And if they do, it's hard to know what it is. So this book is designed to be a roadmap to that. Beautiful, Brent, and, and I really enjoyed it. And uh, before we get into things like how the listener can avoid neurotoxins and, and what what the top ones are that they that they should be avoiding, and also I, I of course want to touch on uh, what you described as the serotonin deficiency theory, which so many people at least know someone with depression who's walked into a, a psychiatrist's office and they they've diagnosed them with being low in serotonin and uh, you know put the put them on SSRIs these uh, these drugs like Prozac. But but first I want we were sharing offline a little bit and I was saying that uh, really my uh, gateway into learning about neuroscience and, and neurogenesis and trying to achieve this peak 
performance in, in this way and sharing it with others really came from beginning to travel and opening up my mind to new ideas and starting to practice yoga and learning how to to meditate and discovering a, a world outside of my own where I was just living in New York and stressed out and uh, just in my own little bubble caught up in 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 the rat race if you will but I, I'm curious Brent how you know I know that you come at this from, as you said, a background in transpersonal psychology, but were you always interested in yoga? Were you, uh, did you have a, a massive spiritual awakening? Was it at psychedelics during college? Uh, what, what brought you into this world? Uh, yeah, you, you nailed it. <laughs> All of those things. I, I, was an, I was a hardcore atheist until I went to college. And then I took LSD. Okay. <laughs> and that changed everything. That opened me up to new experiences that I couldn't explain and opened me up to spiritual realities and um, cosmic consciousness, experiences of light, of feeling just bliss, the entire universe aware of itself in one ecstatic moment, um, out of body experiences, um, entering the Buddha stream, many different experiences. But then, and so that got me really into spiritual practice. And at a certain point, the drugs dropped away because I realized that I, I wanted to live there. I didn't want to just visit there. And each time I did the drugs, and I did quite a bit of them for quite a while, I got kicked out of Eden afterward. I got kicked out of heaven when the drugs were off and had no clue how to get back. And so I came to the conclusion it, it eventually comes down to some kind of psycho-spiritual practice, some kind of ongoing meditative yogic practice to actually shift consciousness. It's like you need to, I felt like I needed to develop the muscles consciousness-wise to begin to live there more and more. So yeah, that's what opened me up to it and sort of got me into this path. That's really interesting, and uh, I want. While we're on the topic, I did want to to elaborate a little bit for the listener who might not be as open to psychedelics as as people who follow the same types of research that that you've probably heard about. How you know psychedelics can be amazing, uh, be amazing treatments in in clinical settings for uh, people with depression and uh, or PTSD, for example, or people have probably heard, well, uh, it's come up on the, uh, my podcast quite a few times about uh, people doing ayahuasca and, uh, you know, with, with shamans in Peru, and it's become much more popularized. Uh, but I did want to, to touch on uh, your experience, as you said, kind of fall, falling out of Eden or coming back to Earth uh, and it not being such a pleasant experience, um, you know, and that there are warnings on these things or, or actually even worse, there are no warnings when someone gives you a, a tab of, of LSD probably sometimes. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious if you could just explain a little bit more on if someone was interested uh, in going that route to try to elevate their own consciousness and shake themselves out of what their uh, what their funk is or try to explore the the depths of the universe because they're really feeling truly called to that uh, what would you tell these people well i guess i would say it's good to at least start out with a guide um people who just take it since the effects depend so much on set and setting, meaning your own internal psychological, physical set and the setting, the people you're around, the environment you're around, that when these drugs first hit America, there was no psycho-spiritual context for this. Um, and so other cultures who have used these substances, these medicines for thousands of years, have a spiritual context in which they do them in and that that is really important so to work with a guide whether it's a shaman or whether it's a psychologist or whether it's somebody who's operating in the underground psychedelic network or whether it's part of a research study 
that having a psycho-spiritual context is really helpful to be able to then work with the difficult material that comes up. Because what these substances do is they lower our defenses. And so our wounds, our shadow material, the stuff we're avoiding comes up. And we need to be able to be with it and work with it and move through it. And what the psychedelics do is they give a kind of inner resource to deal with it in ways that we don't have in normal consciousness. So Stan Groff, who has worked with LSD psychotherapy for decades in Czechoslovakia and later here, um, the current work being done with psilocybin and depression and end-of-life anxiety, and with MDMA, ecstasy, being used for PTSD, these all show that when these negative experiences come up, if we are then with them and we just surrender to them, open to them, that then the psyche just has this healing potential that moves us through these difficult, even hellish periods if we don't resist it. That's, that's really what a bad trip is. A bad trip is when somebody doesn't want to look at whatever is coming up and so they try to resist it. But since the defenses aren't in place, it gets bigger. And so they try to resist more and it gets bigger and they resist and it gets big and they freak out. The answer to a bad trip is to stop trying to push it away, to float downstream, to open to it, to say, what does this paranoia have to teach me here? What does this negative feeling have to teach me? And then we go with it, we go into it, and then emerge out usually into a more integrated, more blissful state, having integrated and worked through this experience. So unless you have a context that supports that kind of healing, then it's more of a roll of the dice. Um, so your first, I don't know, five or 10 experiences, I think it's really helpful to have that kind of guidance and then you can kind of do it on your own. But at, again, even then, I think it's important to have this intention to do it in a healing or a growthful um, way where we're doing this to sort of open to new realms. And interestingly, psilocybin increases neurogenesis and so does ayahuasca. It increases the rate of neurogenesis. I had that on my list of questions for you, actually. I was really interested because I don't know that you touch on that in your book for, a, of course, a handful of reasons, and uh, I don't want to spend the, the whole uh, podcast uh, talking about psychedelics, but we're, we're leading off with the, the big arms, I, I think, uh, right, off the, right off the bat here. But it's, it, it, it's very, yeah, very important for people to, to understand that. And I, I'm curious, uh, when does someone know that they're ready to go on a psychedelic journey to, uh, if they have an intention, uh, be, if they have an intention behind it, uh, myself, for example, you know, I don't have lots of psychedelic experience, but for, for several years, I was called to going to Peru to experiencing ayahuasca with a shaman uh, in a in the right set and setting, and uh, it was something that I did lots of research about. And, but I also had other tools, knowing that when I did come back to Earth, okay, I could come back to my yoga and meditation practice, and I wasn't going to just go back out and. Uh, be a binge drinker or I was going to eat the the right foods when I came back to continue my neurogenesis or I had you know I had experience with fasting before I went into the plant medicine ceremony so I'm curious when a person knows that they are ready for that that's a good question I think there's just some sort of basic trust you have in yourself that okay I can do this you know the amount of freakouts it's it's very tiny even in the worst of the psychedelic heydays in the 60s it was never thought to me more than like one percent so it's 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 actually quite a rare thing but it does happen and knowing how to navigate it 
and just go with it is really important. And I think if you just have that basic trust that the psyche is something you can trust and you're with somebody, at least initially, who also has that trust, you'll be fine. Okay, excellent. Uh, excellent. And, and uh, Brent, I'm trying to think of <laughs> where do we go? Where do we go from, from here? I actually wanted to ask you about uh, more clinical psychology and, and, as you said, transpersonal psychology. And you talked about, okay, if you are on a uh, psychedelic journey and you are fronted with your, with your shadow or your demons or whatever you want to call them and you have the wherewithal or the intention to go with the experience and face it and get through to the other side and try to get past that uh, in your life. When you speak with someone at your clinical practice, uh, do you, are you often seeing the same types of things brought up over and over and people kind of just digging up the past and talking about it and kind of getting stuck in these types of cycles or maybe you try to guide them past that in your practice but a lot of people will say that uh, some clinical psychology can be a waste of money because it's a it's a great uh, it's a great business model you go in and you talk about the same old stuff and dig it up from the past and get upset with it again and uh, you know fumigate for, or, uh, for a week on it, and then you go back and you do the same kind of thing. So I'm curious uh, what your stance is on that, Brent. Boy, that, uh, that's a great question. Um, I teach therapists. I teach in a graduate program, so I teach psychotherapy. And one thing that I confess is a kind of dirty little secret in the profession is there's a lot of bad therapists out there. There's a lot of very poorly trained therapists who only know, say, for example, cognitive behavior therapy. Now, cognitive behavior therapy is wonderful in certain ways. Um, something like 80% of therapists in the United States identify with that as a orientation. But it's very, very limited. It's basically about changing your cognitions. It's very heady. Most therapy does not go into the experiential depths of the psyche. For that, we need the depth therapies, the humanistic existential therapies that involve the body, and also the psychoanalytic existential therapies that go into the relationship, into the here and now. Um, you can look at, at therapies as being either right brain focused or left brain focused or balanced. And it seems like the balanced ones have the best rates of cure. So if it's a really, really heady therapy, as many therapies are and many therapists are because they haven't done much of their own inner work, then the therapy is probably not going to be that effective. But if you have somebody, a therapist, who has also done their inner work, and has an experiential orientation, can really go more deeply into the psyche, then I think we see some really good results. And unfortunately, I think most training programs are just kind of superficial. So I say this after decades of teaching in the field, and I believe in psychotherapy, but I've also seen that there are a lot of poorly trained therapists out there, and I've heard a lot of therapists therapist horror stories from clients who have gotten nowhere. So yeah, I understand what you're saying. And, and it, it's, you just need to find a therapist that feels like this person really, I, I can feel safe to go deep with, and they know how to go deep, they can go there. They're not going to be scared or anxious or get me talking about something else if I do. Okay, excellent. And uh, as we're kind of, <laughs> it's funny, most interviews, you know, of course, we might start with, oh, what, what kind of foods could we start to eat to, to increase neurogenesis? And you might say blueberries, and uh, then we gradually get deeper, but we might actually just take the funnel the, the other way and uh, start with, with consciousness and, and spirituality and then come more into, into the body here because you talked about, uh, you talked about how we want to take a holistic view 
of all of this stuff. And if your therapist is just kind of digging up the same stuff in, in your cognition over and over, uh, okay, you might want to look at for somebody who has more of a balance and that you can go on a, on a deeper level to, to push through. So I, I'm curious what types of practices, uh, like meditation for, for one, would you suggest for someone who's trying to develop a more uh, holistic mind and just feel better in, in general? Good. Well, there are two forms of spiritual practice that seem to have this very robust effect on the rate of neurogenesis. And these two spiritual practices are, first of all, mindfulness practice, and second of all, heart opening practices. So neurogenesis occurs mainly in this structure of the brain called the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is this crescent moon shaped structure. Actually, we have one on the right side and one on the left hemisphere. There were actually have two hippocampi, but it's usually referred to in the singular. And one end of the hippocampus goes into cognition and the processing of new memories. It doesn't store new memories, but it processes new memories. It forms new memories. So in Alzheimer's, for example, which massively attacks the hippocampus, we get people who can't form new memories very well. The other end of the hippocampus goes into emotion regulation, particularly stress, anxiety, and depression, as well as the body and physical and spatial relations. So the hippocampus is this funny structure that is involved in body, heart, and mind. And when we do mindfulness practice, we get neurogenesis along the entire length of the, of the hippocampus. That, that's really unusual because many things only cause neurogenesis on one side or the other. For example, antidepressants cause neurogenesis to rise on strictly the emotional side of the hippocampus, which is why you don't get a cognitive boost from doing antidepressants. Um, but mindfulness practice, and I'm sure many of your listeners know this, is essentially the process of coming into the here and now, becoming present-centered, coming into this very moment right now. And there's different practices to do that. The most common one, the most widely practiced, is simply focusing on the sensations of the breath, say in a particular part of the body. It can be the nose or the back of the throat, but commonly it's, it's just your abdomen. You just notice the sensations of the breath coming into your abdomen and going out. And you don't try to control your breath. You simply disregard other thoughts and just tune into the sensations of the breath. Doing that for 20 minutes a day, twice a day, for eight weeks, causes measurable changes in the brain, and particularly the hippocampus, which is kind of astounding. We used to think that you'd have to do this for years before you had an effect, but as little as eight weeks shows measurable changes in the brain. The other big spiritual practice is heart opening. And these can be compassion practices, um, the practice out of um, integral yoga, which is my tradition, involves focusing in the heart area and focusing on either a feeling of surrender or love or devotion or of aspiration, aspiration for the divine, aspiration for the soul to come forward aspiration for all things divine and that aspiration or that love or that surrender that feeling opens the gates of the heart and takes us deeper and deeper into the heart opens the fourth chakra um, you can also do buddhist compassion practices having compassion for all beings um, extending this compassion for starting with yourself your close friends, your family, to the whole world. It doesn't seem to matter what the 
type of compassion practice or heart opening practice is, this also seems to amplify neurogenesis and neuroplasticity on the entire length of the hippocampus. So these are two very powerful practices that have powerful consciousness changing potential as well as increasing the rate of neurogenesis. That's that's really fascinating. And I, I think that our listeners have a pretty good base of uh, mindfulness, or at least at least mic mindfulness, as I, I've heard it called. It's it's become so popular, which is fantastic. And of of course, if you're going to start practice mindfulness, you want to find a good source, just like we said uh, about psychedelics. Uh, but the heart opening, I think, is something that is a little less understood and sounds a, a little more. Uh, fluffy to people, and I, I want—I I wanted to to ask you. I'm not sure if this part was in your your book, uh, but I wanted to ask you about heart rate variability, and if you were familiar with any of the work that the HeartMath Institute had done in this concept of convergence, uh, this kind of energy field around your uh, around your heart uh, or around that chakra area, I, I guess. Uh, have you heard of, of any of their studies? Yeah, yeah, I know. The heart math people are doing wonderful research um, and, and publishing in first-rate cardiac journals. It, it's all really good stuff. Um, and I think that their process of also tuning into the heart area and then focusing on a memory when you felt really loved or of appreciation or something like that, that that's a helpful practice also. Um, and again, with, with that comes greater coherence of heart rhythms. Um, you get less stress. Um, it's, it's a wonderful anti-stress technique. Um, the, I guess my caveat about that is that it's a kind of behavioral band-aid in a way. That in, in many ways, I think that this heart opening process, the way the spiritual traditions talk about it, is that it becomes more of a lifestyle. It becomes something that is kind of a living part of your daily life. And so this feeling of aspiration, for example, this aspiration for the divine, aspiration for all things divine, for love, for truth, for beauty, for joy, that aspiration is a living movement inside, or that feeling of devotion to the divine, or surrender to the divine, offering ourselves to the divine. In tuning into the heart, in physically centering in the heart area, and tuning into this feeling, this living feeling, it takes us inward deeper and deeper. It, it opens the fourth chakra. It takes us behind the fourth chakra. And in the Hindu tradition, as well as in Christianity and even Islam, the soul is located in the heart, not the physical heart, of course, but at least in Hinduism, it's, it's the behind the heart chakra. And so as this movement, this feeling of bhakti, this feeling of love, and, and not just with bhakti yoga, but you can even think of Christianity as a kind of bhakti yoga, or Islam as even a kind of bhakti yoga too, where the feeling of love, the feeling of aspiration takes us deeper and deeper into the heart. That's a living feeling that we can more and more live from. And that's different than like a memory of love or appreciation, which is is good for like a quick fix, but I, I think it, it's also limited in that way as well. Okay, that no, that's that's really interesting, <laughs> and uh, I've done some of the the HeartMath uh, Institute has a, a program out, and you you buy a little cord. For like a hundred bucks and you stick it to your ear and it measures your your actual uh before i said convergence and i, I met i think i said convergence and i met coherence and also i said fumigate instead of ruminate ruminate i think that's when you get really pissed off and you're you're fum, fuming on something but uh you know you, you and you can see that the intervals between your heartbeats are actually 
not supposed to be perfect. Your heart actually doesn't beat one, two on a perfect. Uh, there's some variability behind behind that. And so you can actually, you know, scientifically go and, and see this. And yes, I will think of things that I'm very grateful for or, or uh, a beautiful memory or a picture of my little nieces or anything like that. But being able to create that without... Uh, without a memory kind of create that from within or from from an external source as you said from the divine that's that's really interesting thank you for uh for sharing that brant and um as we kind of as we kind of move on into uh you know people can can uh work with these work with these practices as as spiritual practices and even uh, learning new things, right? These are these are things that are going to uh, improve your rates of neurogenesis or just keep you sharp overall. And so, going and pick up picking up a book on a, a spiritual practice that you know nothing about, uh, or after you know, I I wasn't so familiar with the term you used, aspiration. I'll go and and read all about read all about that and and try to to keep myself sharp and learn you know maybe this is something else i can add to the the toolbox so so that's fantastic um and, and as you move into so those are the two the mindfulness and you talked about heart opening and as we kind of move down the the chain here towards uh you know what you describe as building up a cognitive reserve in your mind so you want to be real sharp so that as you get older all right if you're dulled a little bit that's that might be okay or if you've been eating really really uh healthy then all right if you go and have a cheat day and have a couple beers and a, a hamburger and some french fries you might feel a little foggy the next day but your baseline is a lot higher than it would have been if you hadn't been meditating regularly or if you hadn't been doing these positive things. So I'm curious uh, what else you would suggest the listener to do to be able to build up that cognitive reserve. Good. So in, here we're at the level of the mind and how we can cognitively enhance um, neurogenesis and what it comes down to essentially is is learning learning new things being a lifelong learner so there is measurable cognitive decline at two stages in a person's life one is after they graduate from college and the other is when they retire unless you then after graduating from college or retiring do something that involves using your brain, involves using your mind. So teachers, for example, have the lowest rates of Alzheimer's because they're using their mind. Doing a profession um, or being a business person where you've got to use your brain, you've got to use your mind to keep track of many different things. Um, that kind of stimulation keeps your brain sharp. We need to have that kind of ongoing cognitive stimulation and it comes down to really being a lifelong learner so going and traveling in different countries is a fabulous way to learn new things and expose yourself to new stimuli um, reading books reading on the internet writing is also important to do even if it's just email um, but actually uh, putting your words on paper or on the screen is, is an important way to exercise your brain. It turns out that the different brain games and video games and computer brain games and crossword puzzles, those things have are almost useless um, because there's no generalization that happens. Doing crossword puzzles makes you better at doing crossword puzzles. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but it doesn't help with much else. And even then it stops at tops off at about 50 and then the, the rate of rise is very, very, very small. Um, you need to exercise your brain in different ways. So to be reading, to be 
um, encountering new cultures, encountering new things, take a cooking class, take a, it's like do a webinar online that isn't something that you've never done before. Um, meeting new people, um, just in any different way to kind of keep your curiosity and keep learning is really the key. And as you do that, you build up, as you're saying, cognitive reserve. So <clears throat> it turns out that people of cognitive reserve may have just as much amyloid plaque as anybody else, but they don't have symptoms because the idea is that there are other pathways your neurons can take. Now, Alzheimer's, as you kind of indicated at the beginning, it's a huge problem. It's estimated right now, it's almost at 50% now, but it, in a few years it'll be at 50% of 85-year-olds will have either dementia of some kind or Alzheimer's. And since most people are expected to live to be 85, that means most people have a 50-50 chance of developing Alzheimer's. That's, and right now there is no medicine, there's no drug. There have been billions spent on drug trials to come up with something. It's all been a complete failure. There's nothing right now. You look on the Alzheimer's Association website and they'll say there's no treatment for Alzheimer's. But recently it's been shown that working holistically actually is able to reverse the cognitive decline associated with Alzheimer's and even reverse Alzheimer's. So using this body, heart, mind, spirit approach has been shown to reverse cognitive decline as well as Alzheimer's. So um, there's two other pieces we haven't touched on. One is the emotional dimension and the, the other is the physical dimension and diet. And diet is huge in all of this because there are so many things we eat which slow down neurogenesis or are even neurotoxic and there are so many other things we could be eating that increase neurogenesis and increase neuro um, excuse me synaptogenesis or neuroplasticity um, but most people just don't know about them it's like if we want to build a beautiful high-end house you don't use rotting lumber or decaying wood you have to use high quality lumber and it's the same with the brain the brain grows from two directions physically and psychologically so psychologically in terms of spiritual practice cognitive uh, stimulation and emotional stimulation and also physically in terms of diet and things like exercise and sleep too, but particularly diet. So I wonder if we could talk a little bit about diet before we go, because I think this is also hugely important. Absolutely, absolutely, I'd, I'd love to, and I'm, I'm so happy that you touched on uh, the other pieces as well about the, learning the new skills, or I'll brush my teeth with my left hand, or try to use God, I've tried to use chopsticks with my left hand a few times, and that, that's been my, uh, my biggest challenge. Uh, or, or my mom is learning to juggle right now. She's 62 years old. Uh, or my, my, my cousin, I, well, my, my family, geez, this is, it's been pretty tough seeing uh, my, my grandfather with this Alzheimer's. But my, my cousin decided because of it, she said, well, you know what? I'm graduating school, but I'm going to go on and get my master's because I want to keep learning and, and really to keep her brain sharp. Uh, but yes, tell me, tell us more uh, about the diet and, and what you suggest. Um, just one last word about Alzheimer's. Um, you're probably aware of this, but the, the process begins 20 to 30 years before we see symptoms. So it's never too early to have a lifestyle that is anti-Alzheimer's and pro-brain health. Um, in fact, the sooner we get started on this, the better, because it's more and more clear that Alzheimer's is a lifestyle disease and is almost entirely avoidable. That, that's amazing, amazing news. And actually, Brent, before we get on to diet, I, I liked so much in your book how you 
highlighted that optimists live longer than pessimists. And if we're talking about, uh, sure, there's so much doom and gloom around this. And I don't want people to say, geez, these guys are just so negative, trying to avoid all these diseases. But you also go into a, a section where one of your hopes for the future is that when the cancers and the heart disease and the uh, neurodegenerative diseases are cured and they're not, you know, the, these are not, these are within reach, uh, that then people will regularly live to 120. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan of Peter Diamandis and, and looking at how, you know, that guy's trying to live till 700 or Dave Asprey, who continually plans to live to 180 years old. And, and this is someone who, these are people who are, are trying for moonshots, but are looking at the world uh, in an abundant way instead of just the doom and gloom that we hear from the media and all the statistics. So could you touch on that a, a little bit for us, Brant? Yeah. Um, you know, when the brain is functioning at a high level, it has an intrinsic good feeling. We feel good inside. Just just being alive, we feel vital. We feel alive. We feel good. It comes naturally when the brain is functioning at a high level. And we also are extremely resilient when there are setbacks, right? Because life is going to knock us down. That, that's just given. But resilience is the capacity to bounce back. And so right now, it's a pretty dark time in America and maybe the world also. There's a lot of negativity. There's a lot of fear. Um, anxiety rates are way, way up. Um, childhood anxiety rates are up eight times what they were in the 1960s and the 50s. And this isn't due to better testing. This is the same standardized tests that were done in the 50s and the 60s. Plus now we have ADD, we've got autism, we've got all this other stuff that hardly existed back then. So my own sense is that in part this is, in large part, this is due to the brain is under assault. We live in a neurotoxic environment. And when the brain is under assault, its capacity to deal with things and its optimism begins to fade, its intrinsic optimism begins to fade and we get more scared, we get more pessimistic. So this figure that optimists live 19% longer than pessimists, it makes sense when you think that a pessimist is always bracing for the worst. And so those stress hormones are always going through their system. And that takes a toll on the body and on the brain as well. Um, it slows down neurogenesis. It slows down neuroplasticity. It, it interferes with our capacity to really respond fully. So I think that this isn't just um, Pollyanna uh, optimism, but... When your brain is functioning at a higher level, you just naturally feel good. And so you look at the world and you say, yeah, there's terrible stuff going on. There's always been terrible stuff going on. But there's also a lot of good things that are going on. And in my own personal life, I can create a lot of love and joy. Sure, that's, that's fantastic. And uh, so many people... You know, we're so connected to these devices. Actually, I was on the train today and they have these uh, amber alerts. I don't know if you get these notifications yes, yes. on your phone, but yes. I was on the train in New York City and other people's amber alerts on their phone were, were going off. And I've, I've, the first few times it happened to me, I, I figured it out and I turned it off. And, you know, of course, these are to help find lost kids and and all sorts of all sorts of things. So, people can really you can really look at this in a, in a very positive light. But when that thing starts going, uh, 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 I thought they were going to come over on announcement in the subway and make some terrible make some terrible announcement. And then I started hearing it throughout the afternoon. There must be a there must be an amber alert going on and everybody's phone was going off and it's it's quite loud and and anxiety 
Uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, it gives you quite a lot of anxiety. And with the push alerts, you know, the iPhone, you've got New York Times push alerts. I, I think it's almost automatic without even installing the apps now sometime. Some deal probably between New York Times and, and Apple. But uh, could you touch on how people can can help reduce their anxiety in this over hyper connected uh, day and age? Yeah, great question. So <clears throat> most everyone feels too much stress and stress and anxiety run on the same neural circuits. So we need a certain amount of stress, right? There, there's good stress and there's bad stress. Well, we talk about simply stress, but we need a certain amount of good stress and good stress is short term and it's moderate. Um, it has a beginning and an end. But that's not the kind of stress most people suffer from. Most people suffer, suffer from chronic stress. And that's what has this degrading effect on the brain and the body system. The stress hormones affect heart, affect digestion, affect your levels of inflammation, affect brain function, affect every level of the body, and, but particularly the brain. So the stress isn't, we, we can do some things to reduce stress, but mostly what we need to do is to be able to take a break from stress, to be able to reset our nervous system. So one great thing is exercise, any kind of exercise, aerobic exercise, yoga, something where you get into your body, turn off your mind for a while and fully get into your body. And your body has a chance to either rev up and then relax or just stretch and relax or strength train and then relax. But you have a chance to reset your nervous system, of moving into a feeling of deep relaxation. It's also something that meditation does. It produces a state of deep relaxation. We need to have breaks from the stress. We need to not be always on our devices not to be always available to work. We need to have downtime, time where we can just totally forget about everything and be ourselves, be in nature. Just a simple walk in nature has a profound effect on stress hormones. Stress hormones go way down just being around green, even if it's just a central park um, or if it's out in real nature, larger nature. Um, each person needs to find their own way of reducing stress. For some people, it's cooking. For some people, it's a night out with friends. For, but there needs to be some way to unhook and reset your nervous system. Sure, and, and at least if people can get away with turning the if they can't turn their mind off, at least turn the phone off once in a while. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and, and also, Brent, would you mind clarifying for people who – you know, they've been thinking about meditating or they've been wanting to get into the practice, but they, their biggest anxiety be, be uh, thinking about meditating is, oh my God, I could never turn off my brain. Could you clarify what a, what a meditation teacher might say about that? Well, the first thing you, I think most meditation teachers would say is when you start meditating, you become aware of your monkey brain. Right? You become aware of just how out of control your brain is. It's compared to a monkey, or sometimes it's compared to a drunken monkey. <laughs> not, not just a monkey, but a drunken monkey, totally out of control, swinging from all the rafters of your brain. But as you pay attention to the here and now, either to the breath or simply to whatever arises in awareness, as you pay attention to it, the dust begins to settle slowly. And as the dust begins to settle, consciousness wakes up. We become more alert, more awake, and we come more and more into the here and now. So it's you don't make an effort to turn off your mind. Simply observing your consciousness or observing your breath, the mind begins to simply settle down on its own. And in that process, we become more relaxed, less stressed, and more alert at the same time.
Great, great. And Brent, I know that you want to talk here about diet and, and we don't have any time restriction here. We're coming up on about 55 minutes. There's, we can go as long as we, we feel like and, and can get the uh, right information over to the listener. So uh, just as long as you want to go, we can continue. But uh, yeah, could you, could you tell us a little bit more about what type of diet is going to be best to keep your brain sharp or, or even improve the sharpness of one's brain? Okay, good. Well, um, based on our talk before the show, I imagine that you've probably familiarized with your, your listeners with some of this material. Yes. Basically, um, the kind of high carbohydrate, low fat, low fiber diet that is the standard American diet is terrible for the brain. And it's terrible for every other system as well. And is likely behind this epidemic of diabetes and inflammation and obesity that we see. Um, so we want really a high good fat, low carbohydrate, high fiber, moderate protein diet. And in that there are certain things that will increase the rate of neurogenesis. So. We know that certain things decrease it. For example, sugar. A high sugar diet will cut your rate of neurogenesis in two. Um, Omega-3 fatty acids are probably the most single most important nutrient anybody can do. So your brain is made up of about two-thirds fat. And of that, 30 to 50% of it, so almost half of it, is DHA. DHA is one of the three omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3s, or fish oil, consists of ALA, which isn't very important, DHA, which is extremely important, and EPA, which is also really important as an anti-inflammatory. Most people need to take probably four to six grams a day and it's good to have a balance between DHA and EPA. Most formulations have more EPA. That's good because it helps decrease inflammation in the brain and the body. But DHA is the fundamental building block of the brain. They did some experiments with monkeys where they raised one group of monkeys on a low omega-3 diet and another group of monkeys on a high omega-3 diet. And then they looked at their brains. And the brains of the monkeys on the low omega-3 diet were very simple, undifferentiated brains. But the monkeys on the high omega-3 diet had very complex, richly differentiated brains, almost like human beings. Omega-3s, and particularly DHA, is the most important thing you can do. And if you do them, be sure to make sure be sure to be, be sure that the formulation you use is molecularly distilled so that you don't get mercury in it because mercury is one of the most potent neurotoxins known i think it's second only to plutonium so mercury concentrates in the food chain in fish so the bigger the fish the more mercury so we want to eat small fish and wild caught like alaskan fish, not farmed fish. Those are much higher in mercury and PCBs. So we want omega-3s, probably four to six grams a day. Um, blueberries are great. Um, green tea is great. We want the equivalent of 10 to 15 cups of green tea, but we don't want that much caffeine. <laughs> that would be a lot of caffeine. Yeah. Um, they make uh, capsules that are uh, green tea extracts that are 98% extraction, caffeine-free, and 45% of the EGCGs, which have a powerful effect on neurogenesis and neuroplasticity. So a capsule of those is the equivalent of 10 to 12 cups of green tea a day. Something like that is fantastic for your brain. Also, curcumin is great. And there's something else called hesperidin. Hesperidin is a bioflavonoid 
from citrus fruits. And its main effect is to keep new brain cells alive. So when we increase the rate of neurogenesis, the brain prunes about 50% of those new brain cells pretty quickly, unless we do other things such as hesperidin. Now, hesperidin, when you get it as a capsule, is not very bioavailable unless you get it in the form of methyl chalcone. So I'd suggest that people find methyl chalcone as a form of hesperidin. Also things like luteolin, quercetin, apigenin, um, things like this rapidly increase our rate of neurogenesis. Other things that decrease our rate of neurogenesis are things like fried foods, deep fried foods. So <clears throat> French fries, onion rings, anything deep fried is going to oxidize the fat. And when you consume oxidized fat, what that does when you take it in is it oxidizes the cholesterol in your bloodstream and it produces inflammation. And these two things create heart disease. So the old thing about fat causes heart disease, it's not true. It's oxidized fat that causes heart disease. And it's also excess carbohydrates in the presence of oxidized fat that causes heart disease. So low carb, Ketogenic is a fabulous way to go, but most people can't go that low carb or aren't willing to. But ketosis is also a state of enhanced neurogenesis. Um, one of the major ketone bodies, beta-hydroxybutyrate, that we see in ketogenesis, um, that is uh, highly neurogenic. So diet is hugely important, both what not to eat as well as what we can eat. That's that, that. This is all excellent news. And if someone is scribbling down notes, do not worry. We will link uh, these resources, the different types of foods uh, that you may not have heard about in the show notes on under30experiences.com or right there in iTunes, we'll be able to link those as well. I wanted to, clear to clarify two points. Uh, one, this is an easy one, so I can just quickly explain the oxidized fats just in case uh, people don't know. You know, you should not be spoiling your, spoiling your oils or buying your fish oil from CVS or Walmart where it might have gotten uh, spoiled in the truck or during shipping. Uh, and that's, that's really important not to. Sure, olive oil is very healthy uh, for your brain, but you don't want to fry your, you don't want to saute your, or, or fry your fish on uh, high heat and then again spoil and oxidize your your fats uh, there, so that's really put even your even your egg yolks. Uh, I try to keep them as runny as possible because yes. once they get hard and yellow, well, then you kind of killed a lot of the good properties there. Uh, so I wanted to quickly touch on that for the listener, but but Brant, uh, I wanted to ask you just to follow up about the omega threes, the fish oil. Uh, I I personally take krill oil and you mentioned four to six grams which is more than I uh, more than I take and you want a certain uh, a lot of DHA as you said and e uh, EPA is great because it uh, is anti-inflammatory but are you saying four to six grams of omega-3s of fish oil in general of DHA. I'm curious because people need to read the back of the labels here. If you're ordering on Amazon, a lot of times they don't even give you the information. And uh, I w I'd like to really lay that out perfectly for people. Yeah, good. Um, my sense is that with most krill oils, the advertising has been that you don't need as much. And I am not so convinced about that. Um, most of the research I've been reading says no matter what, we need um, three or four grams minimum per day, and probably most people can use more than that. 
Um, so yes, it's it's four to six grams of omega threes, and it, and I think for most people, so half of that would be DHA, and half of that would be EPA. Um, and if you're dealing with depression, you might want to do even more than that. Um, more like six grams a day. The federal government says you, everybody should have at least three grams a day. And the federal government guidelines are always way too little for most all of these things. Um, people need to experiment and see what's right for them. Um, but it is clearly the single most important nutrient that people need. Low levels are associated with greater rates of Alzheimer's, lower IQ in children, um, higher rates are associated with lower rates of cognitive decline in the elderly. Um, it, it's the best brain food out there. And you want to get it in a dark bottle, just like you want your vegetable oils in a dark bottle or your olive oil in, veg in a dark bottle. You don't want any vegetable oils to cook with or to use in any way except early olive oil, maybe avocado oil. Um, as you were saying, but certainly for the omega threes, yeah, four to six grams per day. When you most capsules are one gram, sometimes capsules are half a gram. Um, but to get it also in a dark bottle, if possible. Great. And uh, for the vegetarians out there, I uh, just picked yes. up algae oil. Do you have any recommendations on that, Brian? Uh, algae is the way to go. Um, Doing flax oil doesn't work. They've tried to raise omega-3 and they tried to raise DHA levels with omega, with uh, flax oil and they've not been successful because it is ALA and ALA doesn't convert very well to DHA or EPA. But algae works. So if you're vegan or vegetarian, the way to go would be algae. Yes. Great. Great. And, and Brent, as we wrap up i wanted to circle back to something in the very beginning that i scribbled down that i uh, i did say we would talk about and so if somebody has listened for the past hour waiting for the answer uh they're gonna get it right here we uh well i'll, I'll frame it as when someone comes to you in your uh, psychology practice and they're dealing with depression uh they are, you know, sometimes they can go to a doctor and they're going to say, oh, well, your serotonin is low and uh, that, that's why you have depression and they put them on a SSRI, these serotonin uh, drugs, basically. And would my question for you is, of course, I, I want to let you dispel this uh, serotonin deficiency theory, but also do you first suggest, hey, why don't you go out and take six grams of uh, fish oil for the next X number of weeks and see if we can do that, of course, depending on how grave the situation is and the person's mental stability uh, at the time. But do you take these approaches before you refer them to a psychologist? And have you found that uh, this is working for people in your own practice? Um. Yeah, that's 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 a big, wonderful question you're asking. Um, my own sense is that there is a role for antidepressants, but it's a very limited one, and that they are way overprescribed right now. Doctors prescribe these things like candy. Anybody can walk into the office of a family physician or an internist or a family doctor and walk out with a prescription for antidepressants. They are prescribed like candy. I know of whole families that are on them. I've heard of whole small towns being on them. It's, it's completely nuts. One quarter of American women between 25 and 45 are taking antidepressant. Clearly, there's something wrong with this. Wow. Um, and <clears throat> so... My own sense is that, that there is this kind of brain weakening that happens, but that antidepressants are not the way to fix it. Somebody who is depressed is not suffering from a shortage of Prozac. They are suffering from lower neurogenesis rates in their brain. So they're also often suffering from psychological stuff, psychological difficulties, pains, wounds, ways of acting unskillfully in the world where they're not getting what they need emotionally. 
So the important thing, I think, is to find out what is the meaning of the depression. And I think for each person, it has a very specific individual meaning, a meaning that has physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual dimensions to it. And so, yes, I want to educate. I can't prescribe anything because I'm a psychologist. But I do do education around this. And so I've experienced enormous success working with the dietary piece as well as the psychological piece. Some people just need the dietary piece. Some people just need the psychological piece. I think both are best, but some people just do fine with one or the other. And so, yes, I've had people come off of 20 years of Prozac, which is a hard thing to do because when you start taking an antidepressant, it downregulates the body's own production of serotonin. And so that coming off of it then can be very difficult, almost impossible for some people. The New York Times just had a big article on how long-term antidepressant use is hell for many people coming off it who try to come off it but feel like they can't. But there are things that increase neurogenesis more powerfully than antidepressants. That are, I mean, that's what the book is really about. And so I think coming off with some of these nutritional supplements makes a lot of sense for many people. Um, but I think there's, there is a role for antidepressants, just a very limited one for most people. Brant, this has been incredible information. And uh, before, before I let you go, if someone is looking for a solution on this uh, and they're saying, all right, I feel like hell, but I am going to to give it a holistic uh, shot first. And, and I'm not everyone. Please make their own decision and do what you feel is right for you. I'm I'm not trying to push people in any one particular way. Uh, however, if people do want to take a shot at, all right, I'm gonna start stacking the things that Brent has in his book, it, whether it's uh, the the ginseng or the uh, the geez the um, the million things that you listed off the goji berries and all the different herbs and the green tea extracts and the fish oils uh, I, I know that one needs to be careful before they just start popping a hundred a uh, hundred supplements at, at one time. Do you suggest taking one and then the next and trying out this and maybe some turmeric will work for you? Or do you say, hey, you can dive in there at things that are, are outlined in the book that are pretty safe and you can take five or ten of those in a day and see if that does give you the boost to get you out of your funk or, or make you sharper? Um, I, I think that, yeah, everybody does need to experiment and find out for themselves what works. Not everybody can do all the supplements. Like, I can't do some of those supplements. It makes me feel weird. So each person needs to find out what works for them. Um, I'd say that the, the thing that is probably the easiest try would be the omega-3s, like four to six grams. There have been some studies to show that simply doing larger amounts of omega-3s like this are more effective than antidepressants. There's two studies that show that. Um, the, the pharmaceutical companies know at this point that the serotonin deficiency myth is just that, that it's a myth. And they are madly at work on drugs that will increase the rate of neurogenesis. And when, we, when they discover them, we'll hear about them nonstop. But there are natural ways of increasing your rate of neurogenesis. The pharmaceutical companies, they've got a good thing going, right? It's a $16 billion a year industry on SSRIs. So um, the cartels know what they're doing. They don't want to stop this. So I believe that a holistic approach is, is the way to go for most people, although there's limited utility for pharmaceuticals. Um, and I'm at work on a book right now, which I'm hoping will come out in sometime at the end of this year or beginning of next year, which is essentially that a holistic approach for depression, anxiety, and cognitive decline. This sort of takes this the next step. But in the meantime, um, 
I also do Skype consultations, like a sort of consultation around depression or anxiety. Um, but I think that there is a lot that people can do on their own. That's right. And it's important not to overdo some of these things. Um, and so there are suggested amounts that are in the book. But each person, I think, does need to take responsibility for their own physical health and mental health and see what can they do to increase their physical brain's performance and their body's performance as well. That's great, Brant. And you have a uh, beautiful vision for the future uh, of this planet and that people can take the power into their own hands. As you, as you said, neuroscience is too important to leave to the neuroscientists and we can, we can all start to learn this stuff and be able to help ourselves, help our family members, our neighbors, and uh, yeah, people, people out there uh, in the world listening to this. So, so Brent, if people want to uh, learn more, of course they can go anywhere and pick up the Neurogenesis Diet and Lifestyle, Upgrade Your Brain, Upgrade Your Life. Where can people uh, get in touch with you or, or find your website? Well, my website is brantcourtwright.com, so one word. Excellent. Well, uh, Brent, I'm looking forward to your, your new book and also diving into some of your older ones that I have not yet had a chance to read. So thank you very much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. It's been a real pleasure talking with you, Matt. Listeners, it's Matt Wilson coming to you after celebrating the sixth birthday of our incredible travel company under 30 experiences up there in Austin, Texas. I'm back here in Costa Rica and I have a resolution for you guys. What we've done with under 30 that's gone so, so phenomenally well and made what looks like an overnight success here that's actually taken tons of hard work and lots of relationship building and tons of heart and effort and passion put into what we do every single day. What we've done best is build community. And I want to build community around the Live Different podcast. I want to design a place where you can come and get support, talk about living the best possible life that you can when it comes to the topics of travel, health, performance, business, all the things that we talk about on the Live Different podcast, and I want to be able to support you guys, and moreover, I want to have the guests be able to participate in that, for you to be able to ask them questions, for you to be able to interact, for you to be part of a group of like-minded people. So, what I'm going to ask today is that you send me an email if you were listening to this, matt at under30experiences.com, and we are going to start a super secret Facebook group as well as email list. So if you want in, email me directly and say that, yes, I want to be part of this super secret program. This is free, by the way. This is just a way to build community around what we do at the Live Different Podcast. Please. Send me an email, madden30experiences.com. I will respond. I will get back to you. I will add you to this new group and to this email list so you can get insider access to all the people that we have on the show uh, as well as to the community. So thank you guys very much. I really want to bring this to the next level. Looking forward to hearing from you.